Well, as I said earlier, we're looking today at the paradox of power. And we've come really to the end of our journey with the book Paradoxes of Group Life by Kenwin Smith and David Berg. Who doesn't want to be powerful? Well, when I say that, I don't necessarily mean holding positions of power. But we all wish to be powerful in the sense of being heard, certainly to have our opinions uh, listened to and respected by others and honoured as valuable. That's the kind of power that most people, I think, would like to see in their life. And uh, Smith and Berg, when they talk about the paradoxes of power, they make a few interesting points which I'll just highlight for you now. The first is that taking and using the available power often creates a vacuum because it is experienced as depriving others of a scarce commodity. Power is seen in many ways to be limited and so um, Yes, when one person takes power, it takes power away from someone else necessarily. Therefore, they say that power taking is resisted. But in that resistance, it makes everybody feel powerless. Individuals and the group as a whole. They say also that taking power, when it is dangerous to do so, and this is the important thing, then acting to empower others diffuses the terror and breaks the cycle. And so they say, one develops true power as one empowers others. And they also observe that resistance, the resistance to the taking of power, is an affirmation of authority. But there's another book that I'd like to spend a bit more time in today, and it's this one, Crucial Conversations, and it's subtitled Tools for Talking When the Stakes Are High. This is one of those books that I found in an op shop in New South Wales when Pam was clothes shopping. As I've said before, Pam will go diving into the clothes section and I go and dive into the books and the CDs and the DVDs. And I have to say, this is one of the best 50 cents or dollars I've ever spent in my life. And I want to share it with you because I think it's, it is a very, very powerful and useful book. So it talks about this idea of crucial conversations. And it says a crucial conversation has three sides. A crucial conversation occurs when there are opposing opinions. When the stakes are high, there's something important or significant at stake. And when there are strong emotions. Now the authors of this book say that typically we tend to react to these circumstances in one of two ways. And it's basically fight or flight. So we come to these crucial conversations, and I'm sure you've had this experience of the adrenaline mounting in your body, and we tend to either lash out in anger to impose our point of view on others, or we run away, we avoid the confrontation. So as I was saying, um, the book Crucial Conversations uh, began actually as a search for powerful or influential people. They looked at a number of companies and they asked why or who are the influential people in this company and why? Who are the people that others pay attention to? Who are the people who are consistently heard above the noise? And so this is what they said. We asked people to identify who they thought were their most effective colleagues. We wanted to find those who were not just influential, but who were far more influential than the rest. And so early on in the book, they share the story of uh, a man called Kevin. And I thought I'd like to share it with you, just a couple of pages from the beginning of this book. 
One of the opinion leaders we became particularly interested in meeting was named Kevin. He was the only one of eight vice presidents in his company to be identified as exceedingly influential. And we wanted to know why. So we watched him at work. At first, Kevin didn't do anything remarkable. In truth, he looked like every other vice president. He answered his phone, he talked to his direct reports and continued about his pleasant but routine routine. After trailing Kevin for almost a week, we began to wonder if he really did act in ways that set him apart from others or if his influence was simply a matter of popularity. And then we followed Kevin into a meeting. Kevin, his peers and their boss were deciding on a new location for their offices. Would they move across town, across the state or across the country? The first two execs presented their arguments for their top choices and as expected their points were greeted by penetrating questions from the full team. No vague claim was unclarified, no unsupported reasoning unquestioned. Then Chris, the CEO, pitched his preference, one that was both unpopular and potentially disastrous. However, when people tried to disagree or push back on Chris, he responded poorly. Since he was the big boss, he didn't exactly have to browbeat people to get what he wanted. Instead, he became slightly defensive. First, he raised an eyebrow. Then he raised a finger. Finally, he raised his voice just a little. It wasn't long until people stopped questioning him and Chris's inadequate proposal was quietly accepted. Well, almost. That's when Kevin spoke up. His words were simple enough. Something like, hey Chris, can I check something out with you? The reaction was stunning. Everyone in the room stopped breathing. But Kevin ignored the apparent terror in his colleagues and plunged on ahead. In the next few minutes, he in essence told the CEO that he appeared to be violating his own decision-making guidelines. He was subtly using his power to move the new offices to his hometown. Kevin continued to explain what he saw happening. And when he finished the first minutes of this delicate exchange, Chris was quiet for a moment. Then he nodded his head. You're absolutely right, he finally concluded. I've been trying to force my opinion on you. Let's back up and try again. This was a crucial conversation and Kevin played no games whatsoever. He didn't resort to the silence like his colleagues, nor did he try to force his arguments on others. Somehow he managed to achieve absolute candour, but did so in a way that showed deep respect for Chris. It was a remarkable thing to watch. As a result, the team chose a far more reasonable location and Kevin's boss appreciated his caring counselling. When Kevin was done, one of his peers turned to us and said, Did you see how he did that? If you want to know how he gets things done, figure out what he just did. So we did. In fact, we spent the next 25 years discovering what Kevin and people, people like him do. What typically sets them apart from the rest of the pack was their ability to avoid what we came to call the fool's choice. You see, Kevin's contribution was not his insight. Almost everyone could see what was happening. They knew they were allowing themselves to be steamrolled into making a bad decision. 
But everyone besides Kevin believed they had to make a choice between two bad alternatives. The mistake most of us make in our crucial conversations is we believe that we have to choose between telling the truth and keeping a friend. Having said all of that, one of the most important aspects of these influential people, these powerful people, these people who make their thoughts and feelings known and heard to others, is the commitment that lies behind the power and influence that they exert. Just because you can state your case calmly and respectfully doesn't mean in itself that people will trust you. It's where that opinion comes from. And the book Crucial Conversations frames it as this. It's a commitment. It's a commitment to dialogue. And it's a commitment to bringing what they call the pool of shared meaning together. They look at a conversation in this way that a number of people come together and we each have our own, as they call it, pool of meaning, our own individual pool of meaning. We understand a circumstance or a situation in a particular way and it's unique to ourselves. And what happens as we come into conversation is that pool is shared with one another. And if a conversation is to come to its truest conclusion, then all of the information must be gathered together into that pool so that we all share a common understanding. And so those most powerful, most influential people are committed to this pool of shared meaning. They are committed to the best possible decision not merely their own opinion about any particular matter under discussion. And that is their commitment and that is what makes them so powerful. And this leads to good decision making. And it also leads to a shared commitment to action because the authors of this book make the point that when people have contributed to the shared pool of meaning, even when they don't get their way in the eventual decision, they are committed to what has taken place because it has taken place together. Now I want to go back to the word. We read together this morning these words from Psalm 2 and I'm quoting here just the beginning and the end. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And at the end, kiss the son lest he be angry. Now, who is this anointed, this son? Well, from a Christian perspective, it's easy, isn't it? The anointed, um, we, we have the title, the Messiah, which means the anointed. The son, we have a very clear idea of who that is. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, from a Christian perspective. And if you read the New King James Version from which this is taken, the, the heading that that translation gives this psalm is the Messiah's triumph and kingdom. And from a Christian perspective, there's no prevarication about who this is concerning. But what if you were to read this from a Jewish perspective? You see, the Jewish uh, people don't believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And this is, after all, a Jewish text. So they may well understand that it is the Messiah in a way, but in reality, the other thing that it is pointing to actually is the nation of Israel itself. And any, um, 
any prophecy about the Messiah is inherently in the Jewish mind about the Jewish people themselves as a whole. And so the, the destiny of the Messiah is tied up with their own destiny as a people. Now these are very different points of view because the, the one, the, the Jewish perspective, sets the nations against the people of Israel. Whereas the Christian one, when we look at this as the Lord, means that we are united together as we look to the Lord. But as we do not look to the Lord, we are at war. And who is the Lord that we look to? Well, we read this morning from John chapter 13. Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. A little later in John's Gospel, in the same room, almost the same conversation, the Lord says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And he continues to emphasise this as we go on through the chapters. If you love me, keep my commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. I wonder if you remember last week when we read from Mark's Gospel, we read these words. If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Now, we, of course, weren't dwelling on these words last week. Um, but if you remember the words we were looking at to pluck out the eye, I mentioned that those are, uh, they occur twice in, in Matthew's Gospel. Well, these words also occur twice in Matthew's Gospel, but they appear in different places than the, the previous ones we were looking at last week. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And so what we read from heaven and hell is so obvious to us. No other government than the government of mutual love can operate in the heavens. And the government of mutual love is heavenly government. Reading on into paragraph 218, we heard, such governors do not domineer or dictate but minister and serve. For to do good to others from the love of good is to serve, and to provide for its being done is to minister. Nor do they make themselves greater than others, but less. 
I've talked in the past about the way we think about things spiritually. And one of the things Swedenborg tells us, the hints he gives us, to think about something spiritually, the way we need to do that is to remove ideas of person and place and space and time and material. And this is one of the ways that we get caught up with this idea of power. We tend to locate power in a person. And that actually is not what we should do. We need to locate power in a principle. And to the extent that we practice that principle, we are powerful. To the extent that we fail to practice that principle, we lose that power. So it's very easy for us, and I know in the church in particular, for example, we tend to say, well, you know, the minister is the be-all and end-all of the church. And that is just not so. It is the principle of ministry that is the be-all and end-all of the church, not the minister himself. And anyone can practice that principle. As much as I practice it, I am the minister of this church, but as much as I fail to do so, I am not. I said this is obvious, but I don't think it's easy. What is it that stands in our way? What prevents us from operating according to the principle of mutual love, the heavenly principle of government? Well, I think it's the same thing that stands in our way in entering heaven itself. And later in heaven and hell, we read these words. To enter upon the way to heaven is not so difficult as many believe. The sole difficulty lies in being able to resist the love of self and the world and to prevent their becoming dominant. For this is the source of all evils. I just wanted to share something with you that I was reading just yesterday evening. Um, I started reading a book, an e-book I borrowed from the library a couple of days ago called Brain Rules for Work by a man called John Medina. And um, he did a rather interesting, he, he cites a rather interesting study of um, narcissism. And he asked the question, is it possible to, to overcome narcissism in some way? And this study suggests that it is. They took um, various groups of people, some who were you know, ordinary folk and others who were um, diagnosed narcissists. So wrapped up in the love of self. And they uh, divided all of these people up and mixed them up. And they did two different things. They, um, they showed everybody a, a film of a, a heart-wrenching story, uh, you know, one that really, really makes you tear up. They didn't say what the story was. Um, but then what they did was they divided that, that randomised group into two groups. Um, in one group, they, uh, they just asked, seemingly random questions, everyday questions, nothing to do with the film that they'd seen. In the other group, what they did was they asked them questions which actually drew upon the story that they had just watched. They asked them questions which they said forced them to empathise with the characters in the story that they'd seen. And they monitored all of these people with their heart rate because they figured that the heart rate is something that you don't control. Uh, um, Self-reporting, you know, people can hide certain facts. Oh, no, I didn't feel that. I, I felt this. But heart rate, they felt, was a more sort of objective measure of what was going on within a person. So they found the first group who had been asked these random questions following this film that the, the normal folk, the folk who were able to empathise with characters, these, in these random questions, their heart rate was elevated because of the story that they had watched. 
The narcissists, however, their heart rate dropped back down to a normal level if it had even raised at all because this, you know, they're, they're not good at empathy, they're not good at relating to these sorts of stories that for most of us raise a tear. The second group that they asked the questions that, as they say, forced them to enter into the lives of the people that they had just witnessed. They found that both groups, the normal folk and the narcissists, had the raised heart level, the, the raised heartbeat that indicated empathy. And they even concluded that they were almost able to eradicate narcissism by this exercise. And it made me think, you know, they, they talked about the way that entering into uses, you know, going and volunteering at a soup kitchen, for example, observing people and, and getting to know people raises this empathy. And not only that, within the context of work that they said, this empathy actually raises the intelligence of a group and its ability to function together correctly and purposefully and meaningfully. Then of course he goes on to say, oh, well science has proved this, isn't it wonderful? Well I look at a claim like that and say, well science is actually just proving what religion has taught for centuries. And what we have taught for centuries is the need to challenge this love of self and love of the world. And that that makes us powerful if we can grasp it and implement it in our lives. So I'll finish by asking you, do you want to be influential? Do you want to be powerful in that way? Perhaps you only want to be heard. So given everything that I've said, what are you going to do about it this week? As Jesus said, if you know these things, Blessed are you if you do them.